Uh, Are we recording? <laughs> a couple weeks ago, Jeff Bezos, along with three other passengers, just barely launched themselves into space at 107 kilometers up. And surprising absolutely no one in the space community, this had people all across the globe in uproar. Most headlines and Reddit posts may as well have read something down the lines of Billionaire douche enjoys million dollar joyride aboard phallic craft. Subtitle, give the finger to 8 billion peasants on Earth. Just a week or so before that, Richard Branson of Virgin Galactic also made the trip to space upon his own space tourer, Spaceship One, and with the outspoken Elon Musk at the helm of SpaceX, you can sort of see where the negativity is coming from. After all, these are all billionaires, these vehicles do cost fortunes, and yes, we do have many problems here on Earth which have undoubtedly been aggravated by the worldwide pandemic. These are the kinds of times when people least want to see space exploration and perhaps, I'd argue, when we need it the most. So if you're not already a space exploration loyalist, optimism for space travel is perhaps at an all-time low. All you need to do is head on over to Bezos' Twitter feed or to practically any subreddit discussing the events and you'll see what the public's perception is. And I'm gonna warn you now, it's not pretty. Even PewDiePie's in on it. And second of all, am I the only one that don't care? I don't care. I can't be the only one. Everyone's like, space is the coolest thing ever. It's so cool, I wanna be out. It's cool to try and understand it, but we don't have to leave necessarily the Ark to do that. It's going to take me some time to get over this, but for now I'll have to put my disappointment on hold, because today we're going to look at why we explore space. A quick disclaimer though, I'm not going to be talking about billionaires in general, whether Bezos is indeed Dr. Evil in the flesh, or what I think about Amazon's business practices. I simply have a few reasons why I think space exploration is totally worth it, and I want to share those with you. And maybe by the end you too will understand that we shouldn't rage, rage against the flying of the night. Welcome back to another space video. My name is Corbus and you're watching White Fox. Let's dive in. <laughs> That's the lame man. Reason number one, it's in our nature. I don't think any conversation on the merits of space travel would be complete without talking about the necessity of exploration in mankind's progress in general. I don't want this video to get too philosophical, so I'm gonna try and steer clear of that rabbit hole, but it's still worth mentioning that we probably wouldn't have gotten very far as a species if not for our curiosity. Virtually every advancement we've made as a species has been because of our explorative nature. Asking questions, seeking their answers, and frankly just never being happy about anything. Sadly, we did not evolve to be happy. We evolved to constantly and insatiably improve our lives through the application of our general intelligence. The forests were too cold, the food was too scarce, the fires too tedious. So we built our own shelters, planted crops, and made clothes to wear. We built boats and tamed horses and livestock, expanded our cities, and for better or for worse, we conquered the world. And it's true that we really have done great deeds, but we've also done some really bad things. We fought terrible wars, set in motion climate change, and infected the global population with 19. Regardless, this is arguably still the best time to be alive. Wars are at an all-time minimum, many diseases have been eradicated completely, and people are on average wealthier than ever. This is of course just my opinion, but I think that we're on the right track, and if we don't somehow eliminate ourselves entirely, the best path is certainly forwards. And short of our species going extinct, there is no way to undo humanity's progress. We've swam halfway across this river, it's an absolute waste of consciousness, technological progress, and really everything it means to be human to turn back now. We can of course stay put and try to get Earth to the point where no wars are ever fought, no shortages exist, no hunger, no sickness, no sadness, but we're always going to be limited by the resources and space of Earth itself. We're better off multiplying our resources by extending our reach to other planets and beyond. Constantly trying to put out humanity's fires on Earth is a never-ending game of whack-a-mole. I'm afraid the reality very possibly is that the biggest problem plaguing mankind is mankind itself. I mean, we've got to be excited about the future. We've got to do things that make us want to live. You know, it cannot always be about problems every day. I mean, do you want to wake up every morning and everything's just a problem? Well, what, in what inspires you and what makes you excited about the future? This ironically is a good segue to the next item on the list. It actually does solve a lot of problems. For all the doubt that is thrown its way, space is an industry that produces an immense amount of prosperity and vital information. It's not just about conducting science experiments in zero G. First of all, companies like SpaceX, Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic employ a lot of people and tend to pay them quite well. 
As of 2021, SpaceX employs around 10,000 people, paying them more than triple the annual US average. Likewise, Blue Origin employs 4,000 people and Virgin Galactic nearly 1,000. And of course, it's not all private sector. NASA and the other space agencies across the globe employ an insane amount of people too, and an independent study in 2005 concluded that at the time, NASA contributed more than eight times its own budget back into the economy. That means that in 2005, every single dollar the federal budget allocated to NASA, NASA put $8 back into circulation. And while these numbers might not be astronomical, the overall economic impact of the space sector really is. It's a nearly $400 billion a year industry, and 95% of that revenue was earned through the production of goods and services in space to be used back on Earth. This is referred to as the space for Earth economy. Our orbits are full of vital satellites that we would really miss if they were gone. Infrastructure related to internet and telecommunications, Earth observation, which increases our knowledge of climate change and the weather in general, as well as warn us ahead of time of disastrous storms. We rely on these technologies to fulfill important functions, from GPS services to the health of our oceans. And the real world benefits really don't stop there. There are so many things that we use on a daily basis that you wouldn't think came from our investments and research into space, but they do. The CMOS sensor that your phone's camera is using was originally developed for NASA's remote sensing requirements. Firefighters use both clothing and oxygen tanks that were facilitated by spacesuit technology. Kind of makes sense. The research conducted on astronauts undergoing bone density and muscle mass atrophy aboard the ISS have contributed to our understanding of nutrition to the point where, according to NASA's chief technologist Douglas Terrier, the compounds used on astronauts have over the years been incorporated into 90% of all baby formula sold in the United States. Modern laptops can thank the Grid Compass for their designs, a laptop that was commissioned by NASA for use aboard the space shuttle in the late 70s. GPS is an obvious one, right? Air and water purifiers, sneakers, portable vacuum cleaners, foil blankets, LEDs used in the medical field, CAT scanners, ear thermometers, wireless headsets, freeze-dried food, smoke detectors, artificial limbs, aircraft anti-icing technology, scratch-resistant lenses, solar cells, the list goes on and on and on. While not all of these technologies were originally invented by NASA, many of them were, and space exploration is ultimately the number one reason that every single one of these devices made it into our hands. NASA alone has contributed to or created more than 2,000 inventions that trickle down into the consumer market. And once we extend the services of space upward and outward into space itself, like the building of bases on moons and planets, expanded space stations and asteroid mining, we can extend the world's job market pretty much indefinitely. And honestly, I cannot stress this enough. If any of this sounds like science fiction to you, the only reason for that is because we're not investing in space enough as it is. Think about Starship for a minute. It's certainly not easy, but it's also not that complicated. Dude decides, hey, I'm a build a rocket, but I'm gonna make it massive. -er. Of course it happened. I think, I think this is a... We could have done this decades ago. Seriously, no new technologies have been invented to make this a possibility. It's just that until now, no one was crazy enough to just do it. We probably could have had moon bases and been mining out asteroids and planets, but we just haven't yet. Speaking of which, reason number three, it's an investment. All of these things that I just mentioned are great, but maybe you've never used a foil blanket in your life, and maybe you're watching this on a cameraless smartphone. Still, perhaps the most important piece of the space exploration puzzle is the potential for return on investment. When you're open-minded about what space can offer us in the long run, you start to understand why there are crazy people like me who advocate for space everywhere we can. Found in the Netherlands, deep within a peat bog, the oldest boat known to man is the Pessa Canoe, carbon dated to be around 10,000 years old. And you'll surely agree that it's not very impressive. It's a kind of canoe called a dugout, as in, it's literally a dog. <laughs> it's literally a dog that's been dug out. That is some violent <laughs> man. These were the first boats used by man, and for thousands of years after their invention, boats didn't change much until the Uru, meaning fat boat, were used in the classical antiquity period in Greece, Mesopotamia, and India. Likewise, the first programmable computer, the analytical engine, was created by the father of computers, Charles Babbage, in 1833. And it looks pretty awesome, but its functions were, like the dugouts, quite limited. For the next hundred or so years, analog computers like this one would continue to be developed for really niche requirements that to most people at the time would seem like a perfectly good waste of money and time. ENIAC, which is considered to be the world's first Turing complete general purpose digital computer, was created in 1945 and cost $7 million in today's money to build. 
and 7 million might not even sound like that much until you consider that the only purpose of this device at the time was to calculate ballistic trajectories for the army. The first portable computer, the IBM 5100, weighed upwards of 50 pounds. Now let's fast forward to 2021. And almost every person in the developed world, as well as many people in undeveloped countries, are using laptops and smartphones to conduct their day-to-day -day lives. And so, just like the world-shattering industries of shipping and computing had relatively humble beginnings, the rockets and spacecraft of today are going to be downright embarrassing for future humans. They'll look down on our technologies as archaic and inefficient. In fact, you could argue that the reason the space technology we're using today is still so similar to that of the late 20th century is because government spending on space programs have pretty much burned up on re-entry. And I personally think that we should be grateful at least a bit that there are at least some billionaires who decide to, in part, foot the space exploration bill. In 2020, NASA received an insultingly low 0.48% of the United States federal budget. One can argue that if we actually spent more on developing space technology in the first place, we'd already been mining asteroids for resources that on Earth are considered rare. And once we get to the point of mining asteroids and building colonies on other worlds, we don't even know what the returns could be. The extreme rarities of today, like platinum or diamonds, diamonds not that rare, but still, they could be the common commodities of the future. As long as our population is increasing, Earth's shortages aren't going anywhere. But if we can colonize other worlds, who knows where we'll end up? So for all its real world, present day benefits, and there are those, space exploration still isn't primarily about today. It's about the future. So yeah, penis rocket going up, carrying smug looking billionaire and his cool cute friends, might be a bit alienating to most of us. But it's not for nothing. The technology that old Jeff helped to produce serves a much greater function, potentially down the road, than just giving him a view, even if it did do that. Thanks so much for watching, guys. If you enjoyed the video, you know what to do, and you're welcome to subscribe for more. If you didn't enjoy the video, give me a thumbs down, please. And if you're feeling social, leave me a comment. I guarantee I'll read it. Also, if you can think of anybody interested in space and technology in your life, maybe they'll be interested in this video too, so I'd really appreciate it if you'd maybe share it with like-minded people. Thanks again for watching White Fox, and I'll see you next time.